this is how we've looked at process data. And this is what we've done in the past. So a lot of the schools that we're working with have actually gone through this particular past practice. But we wanted to make sure in our team that everyone kind of understood this flow, especially if you're a new facilitator. Move on to the next one. So when we think about process data that we just looked at, so how do we typically use process data? Now we're gonna look at the outcome data. Um, some people thought that the annual data changed because of the pandemic, but aha, it did not. The annual data actually changed because our questions changed. So after being in the network for so long and going through those executive summaries, there was this, uh, this, co this, this community that came together and they were, they're so amazing, I can't remember all of their names, so I'm not even going to name any of them. But there was this group that came together and said, is that executive summary and is that um, evaluation plan really working for us? Is it answering the questions that are really important that what we need to actually track and follow? And the answer became, we do not need to be calling HR and trying to figure out the percentage of staff attendance. And all of us who were been here for a while, we all went, <laughs> Thank goodness, because that was a really hard one to help schools because they usually don't track it like that, right? So many of us would always have to go back to our schools and say that. So that's not the case anymore. From 2020 and onward, all that we're going to need to do, because these are the data that answer the question for the evaluation, is the number of school days, the number of students, the number of major office discipline referrals, the total number of days of out-of-school suspension, the total number of students expelled, the number of students that were placed in educational settings outside the neighborhood school, the number of students who were placed outside that were placed because of emotional disability, and then the name of any collaborating uh, mental health agencies. So these data are much more focused because future evaluation reports that um, Tim Runge is gonna provide to us in the field are really gonna focus on those particular outcomes. Anything to add, Nicole, Tina, Catherine? Okay. Christine, you want to change? All right, passing, I'm passing the torch. I'm throwing the ball over to Karen. Let me try that again. I am KSP, as Becky referred <laughs> to me. I was muted there. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, regardless this year, you are starting with those perceptual surveys. You are starting with the uh, self-assessment and the, um, even though the, this is not required for for, out, or for um, recognition, the, um, or participation, the um, school safety survey. So the self-assessment survey, you're gonna have a couple, um, you might have a little pushback with some of the questions because I've spoken to some of my schools schools already and they're a little hesitant to move forward with this. Um, I went in and really looked at the questions to see what would be their hesitancy. And I listed some of them up there that, that I think would be their hesitancy. Um, the questions, and I think if your schools are like my schools, they're, they're very difficult on themselves. They read way too into these questions and they need to read them and answer them for, um, how they are stated. So uh, the first one is from the systems level, question 11, and then there's some non-classroom setting ones that may be of issue. Um, but, you know, I, I'm encouraging my schools, and I hope you are too, that hopefully they are still completing these surveys. Um, we, you know, we have to honor the perception that is there, that staff feel right now. Yes, the context has changed. That's okay. Um, we will have to reframe that going forward and saying, yes, you know, we understand that question number blind came out a little bit lower than last year, but let's discuss the reasons why it came out a little bit um, lower. Um, as far as the um, school safety one, that one's also very important. And I do spend a lot of time with my PBIS core teams looking at both of these um, survey results. That This one's about the risk and protective factors. And being that we were in a really crazy year, some were virtual all the time, then we went to hybrid and, um, you know, back and forth, those risk factors may change. And, and again, because context has changed. So they're just equally as important to look at, especially uh, the comments that staff make, honor them, own them, um, possibly develop an action plan and some professional development around them. So these really are your basis for 
any of the fidelity checks that you will be performing, whether it's the TFI or the BOQ or the TIC. Well, that was a whole lot of talking. <laughs> and we wanted to make sure that everybody kind of took a breath. <laughs> and if you can grab your um, stamps, and I think, who was the one who was able to clear it last time? Tina, was that you? That's me. Oh, it was you, Christine, okay. So, um, so you're more than my right hand woman, Christine. <laughs> so when you look at this question, how comfortable do you feel just knowing what the changes of the annual data are, making sure that we're using the safety survey and the self-assessment survey, even though we only have 80% right now at the recognition for self-assessment and those changes that we're, we're, um, we talked about with Fidelity. And if you find yourself on a three, know that, take a look at those who are stamping. Look at those names that come up in that annotation. Those are your, your lifeline. That's who you call. Right? Because we're all here to help each other. All right, thanks so much for the feedback. Christine, do you mind clearing? You're awesome. All right, so when we had our coaches meeting on January 19th, they had, uh, Becky used the phrase, um, this year, as far as we're looking at uh, recognition, we're just keeping our place in line. And I really like that phrase, and Christine and I have used it with our teams because, because I think it's um, very easy to understand that about just keeping your place in line, not trying to move forward, you know, we're still participating, still doing all the things that are required of us, but just holding our place in line. So again, if you were recognized for tier one sustaining last year, you'll keep that status. Whatever you were last year, that status stays as long as you have met the requirements for this year of participation. Okay, this one is me. Um, so there was a lot of confusion as far as, you know, what do I do? When do I do them? When do I do the surveys? How do I do it? Uh, so I put a little picture in here to help me remember with it. If you are currently training schools, this is the slide you pay attention to. Um, so I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly because the next slide talks about, okay, they're already trained. I need to like, you know, do a fidelity check. So if you are currently training schools, continue training them as you possibly can. Um, they have already done the self-assessment and the uh, safety survey. You're not repeating that. They've already turned in the annual data. You're not returning, uh, repeating that right now. Um, when you are done training, you will do the tick. As Becky said, the tick is your ticket into the network. Um, when you're done training, there should be an action plan. And when you're done training, and actually yearly, despite that, you're going to have to ask for that annual P-TRAC data. So this is if you're in training. If you flip to the next slide, Christine. Okay, so this is probably the majority of the where most of us are, um, you know, working from at this point. So this one is done training, and they did it prior to the fall. So everybody right now in this position, you need to open those surveys. I would open them now. They're the first things that have to get done. Have to get both the SAS and SSS done. Once they are done and you have your core team really take a deep dive looking at those, then the core team is ready to complete the fidelity check as they will be um, answering questions on behalf of their colleagues. That's why you want to do a deep dive of those surveys so they can really get a feel for how their colleagues are feeling right now. So whether that's a TIC, a BOQ, or a TFI, you're completing one of them. Um, this year, this is a change. There's no qualifying score. In the past, it's been 70. In the past, it's been different. If you were around when we were doing the set, there's no qualifying score this year. It just has to be done and put into the system, P-TRAC system, before June 30th. In addition, as you would always do, action plan. And in addition, as you always do, the P-TRAC annual data all by June 30th. So well, happy Friday, everybody. Uh, I'm Christine Sanker. I, I suggested to Becky that 
we have a slide that real, I'm a very visual person. So to me, this is like a, a menu of options. And it was mentioned several times that you as the facilitator can use your best judgment, what fidelity tool you think is most appropriate for your school teams. But I thought maybe it would be helpful to have those three options laid out for you. So tier one only, your options are the benchmarks of quality or using the tick. There is no walkthrough when you're using either of those. And as they said, there's no qualifying, no minimum score, but you do need to action plan. And we did hyperlink and put in that folder um, a BOQ that Dawn and I like to use because there's an action plan built in after so many questions and, and this BOQ that we've used for quite a number of years. So if you choose to use that, you are welcome to. You're not required to. Your second option at tier one might be using the tiered fidelity inventory. Knowing that you need to do a walkthrough, either a face-to-face -face or a virtual, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. There's still no minimum score and you still need to action plan. There, remember, if you remember back in the TFI, there are a few questions that relate to the walkthrough when we're uh, interviewing students and staff. So that, that is why that the walkthrough would be something that you need, really need to consider. Then the third option is using those tools for tier one that I just mentioned, the BOQ, the TIC or the TFI. And if you have schools that need to use the, um, they've had fidelity at advanced tiers at tier two and tier three, you have to use the TFI. So you would use the TFI for portions tier two and tier three. There's still no minimum score. You still need to action plan at all three tiers. You have to take that into consideration. But remember, if you use the TFI, that equals a walkthrough. But if you use the BOQ or the TIC, you do not have to complete a walkthrough. But anywhere for tiers two and three, you need to use the TFI and you need to action plan at all three tiers. I think this is Kurt. Thank you. I just unmuted. Um, <laughs> some tips to consider. Uh, as you can see earlier, we have we have a variety of different options to choose from when we're deciding on the fidelity measure we're going to actually use. This slide's really designed to help you kind of look at those different measures and some take into some considerations on on what might work best for your your school or your building that you're working with. So when we're looking at the BOQ. Um, the BOQ uh, is done, the self-assessment school safety survey must be done, uh, must be completed prior to completing both of these tools. So um, that's one thing to uh, keep in mind. But with the BOQ, you're going to use that data uh, from your self-assessment and school safety surveys to help really dive into those questions and help you answer those based on your staff perception and your core team's information. Um, the BOQ, again, like we said prior, does not require the walkthrough. That's one of the great benefits of, of using the BOQ during this, this time uh, with the pandemic and the walkthroughs being very difficult to complete. Um, but the limitation of the BOQ is that it only measures fidelity at that tier one level. Um, and you would, would need to use that TFI for, for more advanced tier level. The BOQ may be combined again with that tier, uh, TFI for tiers two and three. Now, uh, if you are combining the BOQ with the advanced tiers, uh, with the TFI, you will not do the walkthrough, um, but you will do your tier two, tier three um, assessments using the TFI, but the BOQ will serve as your primary tier one assessment. So those are some things to consider about the BOQ. Now the TFI, um, it's gonna take a much larger commitment for our districts or our buildings to um, uh, engage in the TFI process. So one of the biggest commitments that are they're going to be uh, the biggest barrier, I think, to commitment would be that walkthrough that you have to complete um, because of the social distancing requirements that are that are in place. So if you do have a team that chooses to do the TFI, I would consider scheduling the walkthrough first. And once you get that walkthrough completed, you know that they're committed to that process. Because if you go through and do the elements and the questions first, and then they back out and don't want to do the walkthrough, then your measures won't be uh, valid for that TFI at a universal level. So it might be best to get that walkthrough done first, then you move into your questions around the fidelity at tier one, 
tier two, tier three. So I think that's something really important to consider. Um, the walkthrough can, completed, uh, uh, can be completed prior to the self-assessment and school safety surveys. So if you're on a limited amount of time and you don't wanna do your walkthrough with your interviews um, or your walkthrough with your, your fidelity questions, um, you can complete those, uh, that walkthrough prior to having your self-assessment or school safety surveys complete, then complete the surveys, then go back and do your uh, fidelity questions. Um, you can consider doing the, uh, the walkthrough virtually. We're going to talk a little bit about that in the next few slides, um, but it can be done virtually. I've done it virtually. It's, it's not the best thing to do, um, but it can be done, and we're going to give you some tips on how that might work. And then the uh, self-assessment school safety surveys must be completed prior to the team meeting to complete those remainder of the assessments that are those um, uh, tier one fidelity questions, tier two, tier three fidelity questions. Um, so those are our, our considerations when we're looking at the differences between the TFI. And as you can see, the biggest one is that walkthrough that you need to consider. Um, but we do have some ways to, to try to work with that, that walkthrough process of more virtual format if necessary. So Carla, you're up. Okay, so you may have teams that question too, I've done the TFI for several years, why do we wanna conduct the BOQ this year? Um, this is something that our team at IU4 has discussed a lot. Um, we just had a regional coaches the other day and we're, we're conveying some of this information to some of the coaches within our region as to why uh, we could possibly do the BOQ with them this year. Um, and the reason that we really like it, especially in a year like this, is because it really is going to provide a more thorough evaluation of what our teams might need to refocus on. For so many of our teams, um, they haven't been able to uh, implement some portions of their framework with Fidelity just because of this year in COVID. And we recognize that and we kind of want to give them a really good jump off point to be able to say, hey, these are the areas that we really kind of need to revamp for next year. And we're going to get into that a little bit further as we move down as far as action planning and things like that. But we thought with the BOQ, um, for some of our teams, it would be nice to get that thorough look at where we need to revamp in some ways. We did in last year, um, since we were still working through the BOQ with some of our teams, utilize Google Forms um, with the BOQ. And so we basically took, you could see I put a little snippet there um, of what our Google Form looked like, but we broke the rubric apart so that each portion of the rubric was, was right there with the question on the Google Form. So the team member completing the survey could see that rubric question and then answer it just by clicking on the Google form. And if anybody does want to access that, it did take a little bit of time to create because we had to cut, snip, and move things around. So we'd be happy to share that. We just didn't drop it in the drive um, for fear that it would be difficult for everybody to try to copy it. So absolutely, I'll drop my email in the chat. I see Crystal uh, commented, and then you can just if you don't mind shooting me an email, I'll make sure to get it to you then that way. Next slide, please, Christine. Yes, and it definitely is a time, time saver in that way. So what we did typically is last year, I sent out that Google form to our team members and then they were able to complete it independently. And then it really gave us, you could see, you know, with Google Forms, it lays out that data so nicely for us to be able to see where there are discrepancies. So I put a question there, like number one, where the team has administrative support, where all of the team members were in agreement on that. Um, and then on that second question over there, you could see there's a slight discrepancy. Um, and that gave us some really good talking points when we came together as a team to say, hey, um, you know, this is an area where we had a, a few people that were a two, some or others were three, and then the team usually from there, whoever chose which area kind of justified it in that way. Um, so that the data through the Google form really helped with time efficiency for our teams, I found. Um, and, and that is really of the essence right now, especially I think because they're just swamped with so many things. Um, so we did, just as uh, you know, our colleagues mentioned before, is we reviewed those self-assessment survey results, uh, safety surveys, talking about you know, the components of that, the comment section essentially. And then we discussed those discrepancies 
um, to be able to save us some time and really see then where we wanted to go with their action planning. Next slide, please. And, and that just brings me to kind of how we frame this to our teams as a plan for moving forward. Um, because it's just so important for our teams to, we, I think like Karen mentioned, we have many teams that are also very hard on themselves and uh, see an evaluation as I have to get the score that I always had um, because we were doing so great at this and then COVID came along. And so we're trying to really frame it to our teams in a way that we're, you know, this is no fault of any of yours. You're doing the best you can with the situation you have right now. And we want to help you reboot. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use this to rebuild, rejuvenate, or enhance your framework in another way. So it's not meant to evaluate you and say, hey, look, you didn't get this done this year. Not at all. It's more to say, these are the areas that were really a struggle because of COVID. We may have lost that in some way. Let's move forward and really look at what we need to do for our staff to be able to impact our students in, the, in a better way. All right, taking a deep breath from that. And by the way, Carla, if you can send that Google form to me, I can make it a copy required so that I know what you're talking about. And we'll stick it in that same drive, okay? Perfect. I that way everyone the... will have access yeah. to it. Okay. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so the check-in routine. So thinking about what was just discussed, thinking about what Christine was saying about the different options, thinking about what Kurt was saying when you compare BOQ, TFI, thinking about what Carla was talking about with how they were rethinking the, the role of BOQ. How comfortable now, get your stampers out, how comfortable do you feel about moving forward then in the participation process and selecting fidelity assessments and having that conversation with your schools. Kurt and Carla, go you, look at that. Christine, look at that. I feel like I don't want you to clear the screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. We appreciate you um, staying with us. We see the questions being populated in the Google Google file, so thanks for doing that. Um, and thanks for uh, checking in with us too, because it's really hard when you have uh, 93 people all looking at you, right? Not that I'm putting you on the spot, uh, Kurt, because this one is you, but 93 people are looking at you. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate that. <laughs> so some things to consider when you are conducting your walkthrough uh, for the TFI, um, we're gonna talk about the regular walkthrough as well as the possible virtual walkthrough. Um, the first thing we wanna make sure if we are doing that in-person virtual walkthrough, you need to know the COVID policies for your building that you're walking into. So it might be a good idea to reach out to the administrator prior to um, uh, attending the, the walkthrough and, and just kind of having them update you on, on how you would like to proceed, um, you know, the social distancing aspect and how you're gonna interact and engage with the, the staff and students during that time. Um, if, if you are doing the in-person walkthrough, I know a lot of times we would do that during either recess or, or the cafeteria lunch times because we had a nice concentration of kids that we can easily move about. Um, but because of the, the circumstances with COVID, it, it is gonna be a little more difficult to um, engage with those students during that time. So I would consider doing it maybe during the arrival or dismissal times. Most schools now have very systematic arrival and dismissal uh, procedures for getting kids in and out of the building in a safe manner. So if you could just insert yourself as part of that process, that make, make it a lot more fluent and easily uh, uh, accessible to students to uh, be able to pro uh, provide those interviews. Um, and ask those questions that you need to ask to get your percentage of students for your TFI interview. So if you are doing that in person, those are I think two really important things to consider um, as part of that. If um, uh, you're doing a Zoom or, um, or a virtual walkthrough, um, some of the things I've done in the past is I've done a, a Zoom or a Google Meet and have the staff and students uh, come in and I complete the interviews that way. What I've done is, is uh, we, we try to pick students and staff randomly 
I would get maybe a staff list from the from the building administrator, um, and then maybe a, a list of students that are, are available based on different grade levels, and we'd randomly select them and have them bring them to a centralized location, um, and we would do a quick Google interview or a Zoom meet interview and ask those uh, interview questions for those students. Um, so it is important too to consider how you're selecting your staff and students because we don't want them to just set up the, uh, the, the you know, our, our star, stars of the, uh, of the environment and, and come in and uh, kind of have it rigged for us. We want to make sure we figure out a way to randomly select those people. Um, and, and I think that's important. Thing to consider. The other thing that I thought was kind of a neat thing we did um, for a couple of our buildings is they did a virtual video walkthrough of, of the different uh, areas where the expectations were posted. And then they would went, went ahead and sent me that video to review. And I know it's uh, more part towards the, the set that those things were done, but it is also a good way for us to confirm some of those questions about, do they have three to five expectations? Are they posted in a variety of different areas that are elements of part of those TFI questions? So I do like to, to see that they are um, able to video that and share that with us. And again, it's not something I would require, but it is a nice piece to help um, have another piece of evidence to support those fidelity measures when we're we're considering how we're doing our walkthroughs. So there's a mixture of, of you know, ideas for in-person as well as some virtual content. You can use email as well for the questions, but I don't think that is as valid because I like to have that face-to-face -face, uh, interaction on a Zoom or a Google Meet. So you're actually getting that feedback from them uh, in person as much as possible in person through a virtual format. So those are some tips. All right, so I found out this really cool scheduling hacks because I don't know about you guys, but picking up the phone and calling people right now because some people are in the office, some people aren't, really difficult to do, right? So some of us are using Doodle and on the free Doodle, I don't know if you noticed this, but as you send it out, there's some new questions. And one of them says, limit the number of votes per option or limit participants to a single vote. So if you decide when you're trying to do all of these meetings, um, and you're trying to organize them, if you send out a doodle and you have those multiple dates, before you send it out, doodle will now ask you those questions. And you can literally click on limit participants to a single vote and therefore it, you're not able to do multiple. So if you limit the number of votes and limit the participant, you check those two checks right there, you will actually be able to get someone to look at what's available and then they can click on it and put their name. You can download without paying for Doodle into an Excel spreadsheet too. So that could be a way that helps you with scheduling. There's also a way to create in Google Forms by downloading something called Choice Eliminator and the link is in there. So in the PDF, all you have to do is click on it and it will automatically add it to your Chrome. And when you create your Google Form and you're listing all of the different dates and times that you're available, just make that question a drop down, choose Choice Eliminator, and then when you send out that Google link, you could send out one form to your entire network of people that you actually have to um, schedule with. And you'll be able to get one person or one school per time period. So that'll help you out with scheduling. There's a how-to video there just in case you're like, what? There's a how-to video that there's a really great person who explained it to me and was able to get me to understand it. And I tested this. And my colleagues will tell you, I got so excited because it worked. So yeah, you don't have to sign up for something that you're unfamiliar with. If you're used to making Google Forms, now all you're doing is adding Choice Eliminator and it'll actually make it so that person can only pick one choice. I just think it's really cool, don't you? Okay, so this is my slide. Looks like there's a couple things missing. They might fly in if you click, Christine, I don't know. Um, oh, there they are. Sorry about that. So schools pursuing fidelity, and I was just reading this title thinking, mm, I should have phrased that differently. Because really, you should have both student outcome data every single year, and you should have fidelity data every single year to see if things are going well. So what that looks like this year, you know, we've given you all the uh, different scenarios, the surveys, um, but just some, um, you know, suggestions on showing your team some grace because it has really been a heck of a year. Um, talked about this earlier about reading the questions literally, whether it's on the, you know, whatever, TFI, 
the BOQ, the TIC, the, the surveys. Um, you know, for example, on the self-assessment survey, one of the questions asked about, are there procedures in place to address emergency or dangerous situations? Well, it's either yes, they're in place, or no, they're not in place. Sometimes that we have teams who get hung up on the fact, well, yes, they are in place, but we were all virtual this year, so we haven't actually used them. They're, they're getting too much in the weeds, and they don't have to do that. But this, you know, gets people upset. Um, slow and steady. We have four months to get this done, and that's basically what I told my schools, too, that, you know, we have four months. I'm with you every step of the way. We'll chunk it. We'll break it down. Do exactly what you would do for your students to try to help them get through. Um, reframe how to think about those questions. So in order to expedite this, as Becky talked about, a lot of times, you know, if they've already done the TFI or they've done the BOQ, we'll send out, we used to send out like a survey monkey or a Google Doc of the questions. And then depending on how the team answers the TFI questions or BOQ or even TIC, um, those not in consensus, then we would set up a meeting just to review a virtual meeting, just to review the questions that were not in consensus. So we're trying to be very cognizant of their time. Um, I've also offered to do five to 10 minute uh, mini telephone calls or mini meetings on Zoom to kind of explain the process because even though, you know, I, we sent out the introductory email of, hey, you know, this is what it is this year, it's extremely overwhelming. So again, you know, offering to have that conversation, reassuring them, um, sending different steps in different emails. So any way that you can simplify it. Um, also, in regards to the reframing, there is a question on the TFI that talks about discipline data and having access to graphs and being able to look at the behavior, you know, by its frequency and its location and time. I can see my teams now saying, oh, but we only had one Swiss referral this year. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. But the question is, do you have that in place? And the answer is yes. They may have only had one referral or they may have only had five. The answer is yes, and they will beat themselves up and be too hard on themselves. So it's about that reframing and really getting them to concentrate on the question. And finally, I plan on celebrating any piece of this that our schools can do, because if they start and do the surveys and they say, I do, we just cannot do anymore, I think that's fabulous. We'll, we'll action plan from the surveys. You know, if they get through and they say, you know, I know I did the TFI last year, we just can't do it this year, we're doing the BOQ fabulous. So I really am going to try to celebrate each step and each have to as they get through it. All right. So as we know, no matter what fidelity tool you're going to be using uh, for measurement for their participation, we are going to be action planning. And as we've mentioned several times, the importance of using the SAS and the SSS survey results as you um, help them to action plan. And I would like you to look at the words over there on the right. Uh, this is something that Becky shared today that she's gonna be using with her team. Resume, revise, and create. So as you're helping your team action plan, what are some things they need to resume next year that maybe they were doing pre-COVID? Consistent meetings is probably one that a lot of my teams are going to need to resume is having those consistent meetings, maybe that consistent data collection. At the same time, what are some things they need to revise? There are many schools that maybe need to revise their kickoff. Uh, at the beginning of the school year, maybe revising their acknowledgement system. Maybe some schools are going to be ho still holding a strong virtual component. So how do you need to revise your uh, PBIS system in the future and then create? What are Moving forward, what are some things that you need to do to add to your program? It could be about um, adding some tier two interventions, putting tier two in place, researching how do we move forward after tier one. It could be that SAP integration or more mental health supports, integrating trauma-informed practices into what you're doing. And maybe they've never you've never used a universal screener. And so 
after this year and of this year that has been very challenging for many people, maybe schools that haven't been using screeners can see the benefit of having a screener. So as you help your team's action plan, I'd like you to remember, first, you're gonna use your data from your surveys. And second, think about what are you gonna resume that you had going on before? What are you gonna revise? And how to move forward, what are you going to create? Okay, very quickly, this is me again. If you could click away, Christine. Um, some of the barriers they're facing and that we've heard about already is we haven't really, in quotes, done PBIS this year. I would be willing to bet they have done way more than they realize because they forget all the um, social emotional type of support they have provided, whether it was virtual, hybrid, um, et cetera. Um, when the results come back lower than last year, I'm worried my staff will be more deflated. Own that elephant, because I plan on saying, yeah, they are going to come back different from last year because it's different context now. It's not the same context if you, know, you were not in a brick and mortar the entire year, if you were in and out or hybrid. We already did the BOQ and pass. I don't think I can pull off the TFI. Work with them, you know, try to pick the best fidelity with them and guide them um, that's best for them at this point in time. They would know. And I'm not sure when I can ask staff to do yet one more thing. So again, going back to we have four months. All right, I'm gonna to try to bring it home for you this Friday afternoon. We're just gonna do a quick recap of everything we talked about. Um, so uh, first, uh, what we're gonna talk about is the assigned local facilitator should be facilitating all the fidelity assessment measures we're going to be doing um, this year. So you wanna work with your teams to help them uh, work through that action plan, uh, work through the fidelity measure. Uh, it's an active participation process. The assigned local facilitator may opt to do either the, the TIC, BOQ, or TFI that we talked about. You have those options, depending on the availability of other local level uh, operating nuances that are specific to that building are going to help you decide on what you choose to do. And you may have some buildings do one, another building do a different thing, or you may choose to collectively as a, a region um, uh, Uh, if the team and local facilitator determined the walkthrough is not able to be completed due to COVID, um, you could do hybrid, virtual, or other operating challenges. The team is required to do the BOQ or TIC. So if you cannot do the, the walkthrough, you must choose the BOQ or the TIC um, for at least a uh, tier one fidelity measure. Now, if you want to move up and do tier two and tier three, you can use those elements of the, the TFI, but for your uh, general Tier one fidelity measure. If you can't do the walkthrough, you must select the BOQ or the TIC. Um, the state coordinating team has not yet provided direction to the field about uh, teams that did not apply for participation status this year. Um, their present status and their present status within the network. So there will be more further guidance to come on that. Tina, I believe, I see you shaking your head. Um, so we do not know the current standing there, and I'm sure that they're going to come up with uh, some great guidance in that area. Um, if a team is unable to complete the TFI either in person or virtually, they may they uh, may submit the TIC or BOQ as a fidelity measure, and it is due by uh, uh, 630, um, June 30th. June 30th also, again, there's a little bit of redundancy here, but June 30th is the due date for all fidelity measures. Um, and it needs to be uploaded within P-TRAC from the local facilitator um, and also in PBIS apps. So once you complete your fidelity measure, we need to take that additional step and load that up into P-TRAC in our PBIS apps uh, website. This is a participation year. We're striving to help and support teams as much as possible. And I think you heard that theme over and over today. It's all about supporting, keeping your place in line and doing as much as we can and look at this as an action planning opportunity and we are prioritizing it as an action plan rather than a gotcha situation. It is all about growth and action planning based on those circumstances that we had no control over. Um, the BOQ or TIC will allow for necessary teaming and action planning if the TFI and walkthrough are not able to be completed at tier one. So we'll give you some robust information to make those action plannings uh, uh, applicable to your team. Um, for teams previously working towards tier two recognition, um, and they may have already been recognized for tier one, 
please encourage them to continue to work towards tier two. They may not be getting recognized for advanced tiers this year uh, because it's a participatory, but as years following, we want to continue to work towards building that that uh, team. Um, and uh, and again, as we know, our tier two, tier two supports are really about supporting our students, um, and that's the most important part that we're really uh, trying to strive to move towards. And then the action plan, which is due by um, uh, June 30th, should include all of the systems, practices, and teaming that was spotlighted between now um, and, and that the due date and any needs that were detected during the completion of your, your TFI, TIC, or BOQ. So if, if you want, want to complete it with your, your uh, uh, fidelity measure, you're going to want to list your priorities on that action plan. Um, and, and you should list where you got those priorities from and what data you have to support those priorities moving forward for your action planning procedures. So that's our, our general recap. Um, and I think we're nearing the end here. So I'm gonna let the next person uh, move in for our ending slides. So we've been talking about staying positive and how we frame it really does matter. Uh, this is a little video on the framing effect which really talks about that our decisions are influenced by the way information is presented to us. So we have to be mindful not only of, uh, we've been cautious and careful and um, trying to uh, be graceful with all of you as well as we presented this information on a Friday afternoon so that uh, you can absorb it all. We want you to keep that in mind as you are taking this information and presenting it uh, to your teams. Every day, our options might be framed to make a single decision seem better or worse. These two toothpastes cost the same, but we'll think a toothpaste is better if four out of five dentists recommend them. That's almost all the dentists, so pretty good, right? What if the label on this one said, one in five dentists does not recommend. Well, now it's a bit concerning. These two statements actually mean the same thing, so why do we feel differently about them? It turns out, we're pretty vulnerable to the way options are shown to us. If a product is next to a bunch of cheaper items, you might think it's too expensive. But if it's the cheapest product, it might look like a great deal. This is because the way our choices are framed has the power to influence our decisions. In the 70s, Fersky and Kahneman coined the term the framing effect, which means that our brain makes decisions based on how information is shown to us. This can be so powerful that it affects our rationality. While the framing effect became very well known, there still wasn't much research about what was going on in the brain during these types of decisions. The Martino and colleagues took this concept a step further in 2006 by studying the framing effect while scanning the brain with fMRI. And their experiment went like this. Say you receive 50 pounds. Now you have the option to keep 20 for sure or gamble to keep or lose all of the money. Think about what you would choose. In the next scenario, you receive 50 pounds again. But now you have the option to lose 30 for sure or gamble to keep or lose all of the money. What do you choose this time? These two scenarios are actually the same. The only difference is how the question is framed. Did your answer change between scenarios? If it did, you're not the only one. Participants in the study were more likely to choose the safe bet in the first option, but more likely to gamble in the second so much that they gambled almost 19% more of the time when the choice was framed as a loss. Why is this? It seems that we feel losses much differently than we feel gains. Not only that, but we dislike losing a lot more than we even like winning. But what's happening in the brain? It turns out that one part of the brain activated during this switched behavior, and this was the amygdala. They found that it was activated when choosing the safe bet in the first option, but it was also activated when taking a risk in the second. This almond-shaped structure in the brain has been well known for emotional responses to experiences, and it's mainly known for the fear response. But how does this relate to decisions? 
This suggested that emotion plays an important role in switching our decisions irrationally. We have the same brain response to opposite decisions, even when the choices have the same outcome. So it's possible that the framing effect is driven by an underlying emotional system. While our brains and emotions may have something to do with how we fall for the framing effect, we can still look at the glass half full versus empty and keep reminding ourselves not to fall for the framing effect. So we do have some resources here for you. Um, please reach out if for some reason the links don't work or if you have some questions. Uh, we wanted to share as many resources as possible with you. Um, we also wanted to let you know that uh, as far as the action plan, that maybe you've been using one in the past that's worked really well for you so you can continue uh, to use that. Just remember to upload that into P-Track with all of your other data. And I just put the link to the folder off the PAPBS website, you know, the one that has all of our stuff. Um, I hope that Tina's not mad at me or nor Nicole or anybody else because uh, I kind of did it and now I'm asking for forgiveness if that's not what you want me to do. <laughs> okay. So I believe that's the last slide, yes. Yes, it is. That you guys did a wonderful job. I really... Um, I really appreciate that. And I just, I just wanted to, uh, to thank, are, are you guys seeing the, the PowerPoint that they had? I just want to thank Kurt and Carla and Christine and Don and Karen and Becky. I, I, you did a fantastic job. Um, I see the question uh, document is being populated and uh, the, we are going to respond, the st state coordination team, we will rally around that Q&A um, and get that, let you know when that is available. And you can just continue to add to that and we will check back periodically and send it out with updates because we feel that's the best way because you're gonna hit things that you're not aware of as, as you move forward. Uh, one thing I can answer right away I saw in there was about where do you upload the action plan? You upload that in the regular document section at this